Food Professionals Company, Ontario Public Service, so that you can learn about opportunities available, uh, that you can gain insight into how best to search and secure opportunities, and to give you a chance to network. So over here we have Patrick O'Gorman. Patrick O'Gorman, Issues Lead uh, with the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines. Thank you for being here. Next to Patrick, we have Andrew Miller. Uh, he's man Manager, Transit Policy Branch with the Ministry of Transportation Ontario. And next to Andrew, we have Bradley Coteau, uh, Managing Director of Ontario Parks. And next to Bradley, we have Shannon Williams, uh, Constable with the Ontario Provincial Police. So thank you all for being here. So my first question for you, and maybe we can start here and, and move our way down, um, is please briefly describe your department and your role within it, so what your role is. Okay. Um, well, I'm the issues lead for the Ministry of uh, Northern Development and Mines. And what I do, that that's part of communications branch. So I work with the minister's office and the various branches within the ministry uh, just to make sure that the, uh, the minister is uh, ready for whatever issues might come up that day. Uh, so I do a lot of um, uh, scanning of the media for any uh, issues related to our ministry. I, um, I check with other ministries uh, that uh, have sort of, sort of similar issues. And I deal very closely with the minister's office to identify any issues that might be coming up uh, and uh, help develop uh, responses for that. Uh, so I am the manager of the Provincial Transit Policy Office in the Transit Policy Branch for the Ministry of Transportation. So I run a team of policy professionals that oversees a variety of transit projects and programs for the province of Ontario. So on any given day, we're looking at one of these files. So. They all, every day is different. Um, this morning I was consulting with some folks about a, uh, I'm going to the Ontario Public Transit Association's regional meeting tomorrow to represent the province. Yesterday I was meeting with the CFO of the TTC about their new streetcar order and the money that we're giving them to pay for those streetcars. Uh, so every day involves um, meetings, phone calls to try and advance the, the, the province's policy agenda in regards to transit. Uh, my name is Bradley Fota. I'm the managing director of Ontario Parks. Um, uh, what that means is I'm the leader of a 3,000 person organization in the provincial government's public service. We have uh, 334 provincial parks in Ontario. It's 10% of Ontario's land mass. Um, we're the largest provider of recreation, um, tourism in the province and likely in the country. We're also the largest employer of students in the country, so stay there. Um, and uh, we, uh, we're part of the Ministry of Natural Resources, but we like to say we're the Ministry of Fun. Uh, it's mostly about camping, about protecting important uh, ecosystems and, uh, and services. It's also about search and rescue. Um, we're mostly, almost 100% not in Toronto. So our home base is in Peterborough and in every small town outside of uh, um, every big town in Ontario. So uh, we're mostly rurally and uh, wilderness focused. And so if you work for us, you won't be working here. I am a constable with the Ontario Provincial Police. Not a lot of people hear about the Ontario Provincial Police in the news, but we are North America's largest police service. We hire, we have about 7,000 um, police officers, and my role in the OPP right now is that I'm one of, of eight recruiters that uh, go around the province, and we look for uh, potential candidates who want to become police officers. Um, we also interview um, the candidates and basically, um, you know, get them ready for that uh, role as to become a police officer. So that is um, what I do right now with service. Thank you. So working in the public service is, is uh, competitive to get into. Um, so I'd like each of you to, um, if you don't mind, let us know how you got your start in, in Ontario public service. We can start with Shrina to work our way over. Okay, well, I joined uh, when I was 23 years old. <laughs> so um, so last year. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm actually going on my 21st year with the uh, OPP. Um, and um, most people, when I do tell them how long that I've been on the service, they, they either don't believe me or ask me, did I join when I was 11 years old? <laughs> but um, I, um, I got in um, when I finished um, college um, back in 1989 or 1990. 
And um, at the time, it, it wasn't, um, I wouldn't say it was difficult, but um, I decided that policing was something that I wanted to do. It was either teaching or to become a police officer. And um, I got hired as a police officer first before I was able to pursue that teaching career. So that is why I'm still where I am. Um, I love the job that I do. You have to have a passion for it. And um, that's why I'm still here. <laughs> Uh, I got in through a well-established network of people that I built in order to get into the public service. I have an undergraduate degree in music. That is my only qualification that you would consider post-secondary. And I now have a 13-year executive career in government. So most of the focus of my conversation with you today will be about establishing your network. Because without it, I wouldn't be employed. So that's how I got in. I went, uh, I went the opposite route. I was a, this is my second career. I used to be a... Uh, university professor uh, with uh, I have graduate degrees from Yale and Johns Hopkins and uh, I was a I was on uh, I was teaching I'd finally achieved my goal and I decided that it, it you know as is so often the case to get what you want is to get what you wanted and I didn't want to be a professor anymore I wanted to do something else I wanted to do something that uh, made more of a difference to the community so I applied for a position uh, that was advertised in the Globe and Mail back when we still advertise in the Globe and Mail. We don't, we don't do that anymore. It's all online now. But uh, I applied for it and, um, uh, and I got the job and the rest is history. So uh, yeah, in my case, I just applied for a job straight up and, and got it. But if you don't have a PhD, that might not be the best strategy. So we'll talk about other better strategies today, I think. I was going to say, I think you're the only person I know who actually applied for <laughs> yeah, a job. I don't, I don't know anybody who applied to the Globe and Mail either. <laughs> yeah. Is that still a newspaper? Really? Yeah. Uh, I got into the way, in, in communications anyway, most people do. I started out in, as a uh, journalist and um, news editor. Uh, I worked in a few different papers and magazines across the province. And then I got into uh, public affairs as um, a self-employed freelancer and uh, worked in the private sector and not-for-profit sectors. And then uh, a contract came up uh, with what used to be the uh, Ministry of Consumer and Commercial Relations. And uh, it was offered to me just a short-term one. And at the time, that's kind of what I was looking for. And then I realized that that's how most people get into the OPS, uh, taking these smaller contracts. And they get extended, and then new ones come up. Uh, so I did that for a couple of years and finally got on permanently with uh, the Ministry of Labor. And I've switched to a couple of different other ministries since then. Uh, but that's how I got in. I'll just start by saying that they have to do their research for sure and to uh, figure out what is it that they want to do. Uh, without the research, um, you may get into a job that you don't really like because you didn't research it. However, you can still do it until you find a job that you do like and then do the transition from there. So I would say just make sure that you do your research and you have to have that passion for the job that you're doing. I would agree with that. I think, um, I think you have unlimited tools at your fingertips to find out what government does and who is in government and um, you know uh, the government's entire phone book is called InfoGo where you can find any of our phone numbers for example or our email addresses the buildings we work in um, I'd prefer if you didn't stalk us but nonetheless you have unlimited resources at your fingertips to start creating a network um, and she's absolutely right you need to figure out and target the areas you'd like to work in if you're just simply applying to ministries in the hope of getting a job, then I'm here to tell you, you won't get a job. You need to pick a couple of ministries that resonate for you, find out what they do, find areas of those ministries where you think that, that what they do resonates with, with what's meaningful for you. Um, and then you need to start calling people up and meeting them. Um, and you need to be brave enough to call them up and explain who you are and ask for 15 minutes of their time. Um, and then when it comes time to hire someone in that branch, you're a known commodity, and that makes a great deal of difference, even though it's a very equitable and fair hiring process. Being able to put a face to the name and have an understanding and a conversation with someone is very, very valuable towards the long-term chance of you actually getting a job. 
we should uh, we should distinguish between getting one's foot in the door and getting the position that allows you to work on the files that you're really passionate about. Those are two separate questions. I think they're both worth talking about. Maybe I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So uh, let me come back to how you get the job on the file that you're talking about. But when I do, I think I'll echo a lot of what Bradley just said. Let me talk about the first part is just getting your foot in the door. There's several ways to do that. One way to do that is to apply straight up through our jobs portal. All of our public jobs, public facing jobs are at ontario.ca slash careers. So you should get to know that site. You should get to know the job offers opportunities that are there and you should apply to them. The other thing is the Ontario internship program. We offer a program for interns. It's only eligible to people who are recent graduates of an institution of of higher learning like this one. So if you are about to or have just graduated, you can apply to this program. It gives you a two year contract and allows you to work in a variety of different positions around the government. That not only gives you a sense of all the different opportunities that we have, but it allows you to start building your internal network, which just to underscore is, is so very important. Um, I think what I'd add to that, uh, one of the things that worked for me and one of the reasons I, I first got my foot in the door uh, was um, I didn't really do it necessarily as a strategy but if you're looking to get into the OPS take some of those jobs that uh, bring you in contact with the government so that you get familiar with uh, with how the government works that's really important when uh, I know when I'm hiring somebody I really want to see that that uh, you know they have some experience they have some understanding of how government works it's very different from the private sector uh, approvals processes are much more stringent. I've, you know, I've worked for banks and uh, uh, various other organizations where they don't really want to know what I'm doing, they just want me to do it. Uh, here everything has to get approved. So if you can get uh, some opportunities to, uh, to get some of that experience and get to meet some of the people that are in the government, that's a really good strategy. I work with, uh, used to be Ontario Hydro. Uh, I worked with the, the, uh, the Canadian Red Cross that brought me into a lot of contact with government. Uh, so that was a really good strategy for me that got me a lot of experience and got me to meet a lot of the people uh, that work in government and that uh, led to my first contract. So. I don't want to monopolize, but uh, a quick story may be helpful, which is we have a new woman who's starting as a policy professional in our branch on uh, Monday. She's starting. And the reason that she got the job, I'll tell the story in backwards order. So she got the job. How did she get the job? Well, if you've been reading the news lately, you know transit is a very hot file right now. Uh, we were understaffed for some of our projects, so we needed someone and we needed someone fast. So how did we find this person? Well, she had previously gotten in touch with one of my staff, whom she already worked, she was an Ontario intern, she got into the internship program. She wanted to work in transit. She knew through contacts with one of the people on my staff and had an interv informational interview with him. He passed her resume to me. I read it and said, this is interesting. I heard that this position was coming up. I gave it to the manager who had that position. He read it, was impressed, called her. The rest is history. So you can see the chain there of making connections. But the thing that I would want to point out to you is the reason that I passed the resume on was because I looked at it and said, oh, this isn't just someone who wants a job. This is someone who wants a job working on public transit. She cared about our file. She, and she had evidence. She'd worked on some things in her hometown in a volunteer capacity uh, to, preserve, to help her local municipal transit system work better. That is what I lit upon and said, oh, this isn't just a job, this is a calling. Uh, I, I won't speak for my colleagues, though I, if I had to bet money, I'd bet they'd agree with me that one of the things we look for when we're hiring is evidence of passion. That what it is that you, you don't want just a job, you are interested in the work of the office that we are. You know, so in our case, transit, or managing the media, or public parks, or whatever it happens to be, no one wants to work with a gold brick or a time server. We want to work with people who care just as much about the work that we do as, as we do. And so being able to demonstrate that passion Demonstrate it, not just say that you have it. Demonstrate it through some sort of concrete uh, instantiation of it 
is is so so helpful to getting in. That's great advice. Is when you're preparing a resume to have a resume that's targeted to the position that you want, and that shows concrete proof that that you can do this and that you're experienced in it and that you enjoy it. Um, and if you are looking for support with your resumes, the career center does offer that. Um, I'd also like to ask each of you um, to speak to within each of your departments. Uh, what is what specifically is involved in the application process, and um, and how an applicant can stand out from the competition? So you may have just touched upon this a little bit. Um, maybe we can start on this. Um, well, typically. Um, it, uh, resumes come to me in a, in a few different ways. Um, some of them come through the jobs that are actually posted on uh, on uh, the uh, government website, and uh, that one's very. Uh, it's a difficult process, and I touched on that earlier. Uh, most people that I know did not get in that way because typically when it's posted, it's posted across the province. Everyone can apply, and we typically get. I would say on the average from the ones the hirings that I've been involved in about 150 up to about 2,500 people applying for one job. So you really got to be able to stand out. Um, other resumes come to me kind of just through cold submissions. Uh, people just uh, like people have mentioned, you know, who are interested in uh, this type of work or in the, the particular ministry that I'm in will contact me or just uh, email me their resume. Um, I would say contact first because uh, I'd like to, to speak to the person and not just look at the resume. Uh, so, you know, let me know what you're interested in. Uh, let me know uh, what you're looking for in terms of uh, what type of job. I'll let you know a little bit more about what might be available and where else you might want to check as well because uh, often I don't have positions available. Right now, I work in a very small ministry, so they come up very infrequently. But there's a lot of other ministries and I know a lot of other managers around. Uh, so that's typically where they come in. And then also through uh, some of our programs like the internship program, and the, the summer jobs program. Those are both really good opportunities and a really good way to get your foot in the door. Uh, we mentioned the, the internship program before, which is a two-year one, that's a great one. Uh, but the summer jobs program is really good too. We hire hundreds of people, actually thousands of people across the province every summer. It's just usually for, I think it's up to three months. Uh, but I hire a couple of people every summer and a lot of other ministries do. So it's a really good way to get your foot in the door. Uh, you get really good experience, and like I don't go lightly on these people that they're, they're actually doing the work of a regular communications officer. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, what's on the resume, what I want to see is, um, if, especially when you're applying for a specific job that's been posted, I want to see that you've really done your research, you've really um, uh, taken the time to uh, to gear your resume towards that position. It's not just a standard. You know, uh, something that you just printed off and sent to me. Um, in our job postings, we list what the skills we're looking for, and when we uh, review the resumes, we actually have a a, um, a scoring system. So we're gonna we're gonna mark you basically on your resume, and uh, the highest scores get the uh, the interviews. So you really need to take the time to really go through the entire resume, make sure make sure that everything that we've um, uh, listed as uh, the skills that we're looking for is listed on your resume. And, uh, and that, uh, basically, that's the way that, that you're going to get attention. Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. I think if you're not spending an hour to two hours on a resume and cover letter to tailor it, you're likely not putting in the effort. Um, and you know, as you w move through the process, if you don't know who the minister is, that's going to be a problem for you. Um, if you don't know what the ministry's mandate is, um, if you don't know what that ministry's last year's worth of issues are in terms of where uh, it interfaces with the public, you know, transit's an extremely hot issue right now between the municipality of Toronto, the federal and the provincial governments. And so, you know, Andrew's in a very topical area at present. Um, I really think that uh, you need to spend a great deal of time doing the research that the constable talked about earlier. Otherwise, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're really, you're not fully invested in, in that opportunity. So I, I think that's excellent advice. Um, well, with our, our process is a little bit different um, in terms of how you go about applying. There's a few things that you have to do first. Um, you know, we look for people that have life experience, they're mature, um, have some leadership skills. Um, there's a few requirements that you have to meet. Um, 
you know, the basic ones are that you can either be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. Um, you must have a Class G license. Just because a G2 won't cut it, you have to be able to drive all times of the night. So you have to have that. Um, you know, if you have a criminal record, you must have a pardon for that. Um, have a first aid CPR certificate in level C. Um, pass a credit background check, uh, psychological assessment. So there's a few things that you have to do first before you can actually apply to become a police officer. Now once you meet those minimum requirements, then you, you, you go, you get an interview. And um, myself and one of the other seven recruiters, we're the ones that interview that candidate and basically make the decision whether or not they're gonna move on to the background stage or even to the psychological assessment. And um, so from there, if you make it through the whole process, you get hired. Now there's three classes a year at the Ontario Police College. There's one in January, one in April, and one at the end of September, every year. Um, so those are dates that are set by the Ontario Police College. Now, we have anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 people that apply to become police officers on a yearly basis. So from those 3,000 people, we usually try to hire about 300 of those people. Um, people that apply will you know, be taken out of process at, at various stages, maybe at interview, maybe at background, maybe after doing their psychological assessment. So you know, some people get out at different stages. Um, you know, but if you're one of those people that make it all the way to the end, um, then you are placed in one of those classes um, at, at the Ontario Police College. Um, next year, the Ontario Provincial Police will become the highest paid police service in the province. And simply because um, uh, we will also be looking for a lot of people next year, um, we expect to lose about 300 people to retirement that didn't retire this year because of that um, expectancy in their salary. So we will lose a lot of those people next year. So our hiring, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a blitz, I guess. I don't know how we're gonna be able to manage hiring 300 people next year, but we, it's something that we have to do. Um, so you know, we'll have to get that done. Um, you know, there is no specific education that you need to become a police officer. Um, if, you, if you want to take criminology, if you want to take business, if you want to take accounting, there's nothing specific out there that you need to take to become a police officer. Whether you have a college, university degree, it doesn't matter. We look at each person on an individual basis, what you bring to the table. And um, basically that, that is where the process goes. Thank you. And uh, for, for interviews, mm -hmm. um, what, what can applicants expect during the interview process for each of your departments? Well, they can expect to be in front of me for two to three hours. <laughs> Um, and during that two to three hours, I am assessing the candidate because at the end of that interview, I have to make a decision as to whether or not I'm going to put them um, forward. Um, you know, during the interview, their life is basically an open book. Um, that is not the time to start lying because whatever you tell me in an interview should, um, you know, mesh together at background when the background investigator speaks to you, um, but it goes over everything from your driving through uh, drug use, alcohol use, your education, your fitness, people who you associate with. Um, one thing I want to mention is that once you start thinking of becoming a police officer, you may start thinking of people that you associate with, okay? They may not like the fact that you have set them aside to pursue your career, but that's what you want to do, and if they're your friends, they're going to respect that, right? So the um, interview is about two to three hours long, and by the time we're done, you get to know more about yourself than you probably did based on the questions that we asked you. Yeah, I'm nervous already, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I actually took my use of force training at the police college oh, yeah. a number of years ago, okay. yeah. Um, the Ministry of Natural Resources is generally one of the more desirable ministries to work for. Most natural resource jobs are um, are outside or working in favor of the environment or the ecosystem conservation. Um, so there's plenty of jobs for people with backgrounds in science. Um, there's plenty of work for people that have recreation or outdoors backgrounds. And then there's plenty of work for people in all other fields. Um, it's a very small ministry. It occupies less than 1% of the entire provincial budget, um, which is not unusual. Uh, as you know, 80% of the budget is health and education. Um, and so uh, in terms of the interview process with M&R, 
uh, or Ontario parks, you'd likely be looking at an hour to an hour and a half. Questions are very much competency based. They're going to ask you for an example from your experience. So uh, in preparing for an interview, I would have your top five or six stories together. Uh, I, I mean that in the way that it's intended, where you, in each of those experiences, you can demonstrate a particular skill. And so, you know, I'll give you an example. The question will be, you know, give me an example where you managed a project with complex deliverables to a tight timeline. And the question there is measuring a couple of competencies. One, project management competency. Two, a time management competency. And three, if for lack of a better word, a playing well with others competency. And so you need to, in your experience, whatever that experience is, find an example from your career, limited though it may be, that, that outlines in a very fulsome way all of those competencies. Those are the kinds of questions, certainly in my ministry, that you will get. They will all be competency-based and they will ask you for experiences that you've had to demonstrate those competencies. And so before you go into that interview, have five or six based on, like uh, we, were, we were told earlier from Patrick, all the skills and competencies are listed for you, either in the job ad itself or in the job description, which you can request. So look at those, use those as your guide to fit in your career stories, um, and that will prepare you well for what's really gonna be a competency and experiential based interview process. You'll likely be asked three rating, to do things in three different ways, an oral interview, some sort of presentation, and then some sort of written product. And so it's important to keep that in mind and get a sense of what the written products are in government. For Patrick, for example, they may be issues management plans, they may be press releases, they may be other things. For me, they can be all sorts of different things. And so, you know, in your research, you need to de determine what are the information products that that ministry and that branch and that division produce so that you're ready if someone's to put together a briefing note, which is the classic, right? Um, you know, are you able to do that in a way that makes sense to the person that's, that's interviewing you? Um, please dress appropriately. Uh, we hire, <laughs> so at Ontario Parks in my organization, we hire 1,600 students a year across the province. We're the largest student employer likely, likely in Canada. Um, and so um, I, I hear all sorts of different <coughs> stories from park superintendents and from zone managers and others about how people are, are not only comporting themselves, but their actual deportment in terms of how they're dressed. Um, it's an interview and it's important that you show yourself as professional and as ready to fit into a work environment. Um, and so I need you to be conscious of that. Ontario is by far the best equity and best diversity employer in the province. There's, it's not even close. There's no one else in the province that better reflects the diversity of this province, both you know, in any context uh, but at the end of the day, you need to represent yourself in a way that says, this is a person that I can hire and be comfortable, that in the work environment, they're going to represent themselves in a mature fashion. No club wear. There. I've been through a lot of job interviews over the course of my two careers, and when I think about the worst ones, they're easily all for jobs that I was applying for at universities. Uh, easily. And I, I think that's because they get no training in HR. But, you know, you get questions that were inappropriate, questions that were off topic, <laughs> questions that were racist. We're in a university, you know that. I, I know, okay. I know. Uh, you know you, I, I, this is what happens when you ask someone whose job is to know the history of 19th century Turkey to conduct a job interview. I'm sure her, historian, her skills in 19th century Turkish history are great, but her skills in conducting an interview are terrible. But that's not how it is at the Ontario Public Service. It's all, there's always HR support. It's always a good interview because it's always scripted. If you come to work at my ministry or any of the ministries that I've been to, before you sit down to the interview, you'll be given all five questions that you will be asked. And they'll give them 30 minutes to think about the answers. And when you go in, they will ask you those questions word for word. They might, they might ask a follow-up question if you say something particularly interesting or audacious, but probably they won't. So the way that we get, the way that we make sure that we're a diversity and equity friendly hiring process is that the process is very straightforward. It's very scripted. People get down on civil servants for being hidebound, but this is a case where it works out to everyone's advantage. Everyone gets the same process. Everyone gets the same questions. What that means is you don't have a lot of scope to show off what makes you special 
except through the lens of those five questions. So I would echo what Bradley said just a moment ago. When you're going in, before you go in, before you know what the questions are, in a sense, you should already know what your answers are going to be. You should know five good stories about yourself that show you off in the best light. And what you're thinking about in those 30 minutes you have before the interview is how can I construct a natural, organic segue from the question I've been asked to the story about myself that I want to tell. And that story, should you should think that through. It should be, uh, here is the problem. Here is the problem that the organization or the people I was with were faced with. Here is what I did, not what happened, what I did. Here's how I came in and made a bunch of interventions. And then finally, and here's how it ended up being a great success. If it doesn't end up being a great success, go back and reevaluate whether this is a story that you want to be telling when you only got a few moments to be impressing people. So I'm, I, I, if you want to get a, if you succeed in a government interview, given the very rigid format that we're going to present you with, you should know already what you want to get across before you go in. And what you want to get across is, is that you are someone who is smart, someone who's a good team player, someone who is reliable. Uh, that's what people want. Uh, people who are good, smart team players, at least in the policy world, and I think in many other worlds, that's, uh, that's what we want. Uh, there will be a test. Probably in a policy shop like mine, the test will always be in the form of, here are a bunch of news articles, write up a briefing note based on them. Or here is an issue, like a classic one that we would give would be, what do you think in the next 10 years is the most pressing transportation issue facing the province? And how should the province deal with it? Knowing that you're going to get a question like that, a question about a policy issue, you should think about it. It should be easy for you because, to loop back to what we talked about earlier, if you're interviewing with the Ministry of Transportation, you know you've read what the transportation articles are in the newspaper right now. You know that there's a bit of, uh, a, bit of a contretemps around the Scarborough subway or, and what alignment it should take. If you don't know that, if you come in and you know, display your ignorance that there's something going on with transit in Scarborough, you're, you're not going to get the job. We'll give it to someone who cares enough to have done their homework ahead of time. So, but if you have done that homework, then answering the question, like writing up the note or doing the presentation, it's gravy, because you already know what it is that you're going to say. Uh, well, for communications, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, we're looking for people who can really kind of think on their feet, because especially for issues management, because things come up every day that you're just totally not expecting. Uh, so we're, when you get to, to the point of having an interview with us, we kind of, the fact that you've got an interview means that we already know that you have the skills. You can write uh, a, a news release, you can write a speech, you can write uh, an issues management plan, whatever the case may be. So we're looking more for those those skills that are kind of beyond that. You know, can you think on your feet? Uh, so that's why in communications we tend to, we mentioned uh, these questions that we ask. We often ask questions that have nothing to do with the ministry that you're applying for. And we do that deliberately. And it's not to, to scare you or anything or to, to make you look stupid. Uh, we're going to give you the, the details that you need to do uh, whatever we're going to ask you to do. Usually, uh, you know, write a, an issues management plan or, or something of that nature. So we'll give you the information, but we want to see how you think. We don't want you to, to be able to plan too much in advance. And we're also going to ask you questions that are, like we mentioned before, m more related to uh, your interpersonal skills, your ability to handle difficult situations, stressful situations. Um, uh, when we're working in communications, you have to work with all the different parts of the ministry. So you're not really in a, a silo situation where you just dealing with a certain number of people on specific issues, you're going to be dealing with the, the entire ministry. And uh, you know some of those relationships are going to be good, some of them aren't going to be good. You're going to be dealing with people who don't want to give you information, uh, but you need to get it from them. You're going to be dealing with the, the minister's office that wants information that may not even exist, and they don't understand that, and they don't accept that. So we're going to be asking you a lot of those scenario-type questions, and so that's why it's important to really, like what we mentioned, 
come up, think up in advance some situations in you know, your past experience, and it doesn't even have to necessarily be with a, a paid job. Of, you know, I mentioned before I hire students every year. A lot of them will use their experience either in school or in volunteer work or in sports or whatnot, and those can be relevant. But really think of those experiences where you know you've had a, a difficult situation to deal with, you know, working with other people and how you resolve that. Uh, think of uh, things about. Um, how you deal with, uh, with stressful situations. We're also going to probably ask you a question about uh, a situation that didn't go well and how you might uh, uh, do things differently now because we don't want everything to be perfect. We know that uh, everything isn't perfect and we don't want perfect people. We want people who can learn and who can you know, think on their feet and adapt. So, um, so we're looking not so much in our, our interviews and communications for the specific skills, although we will give you a test on you know, running a product or whatnot, but we're really looking for the, those other higher skills, uh, those interpersonal skills and whatnot. Thank you. So, so don't lie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a big one. That's yeah. a big one. Prepare, prepare some stories in advance. I think that's really great advice. Prepare examples of times when you've proven and not just the competencies that are directly relevant to the job, but also those interpersonal soft skills. Great advice. Um, and so I'd like to open it up to the floor. If, if anyone has a question, please um, stand up and ask it. And I just ask that if you do have a question for the panel, try and make it a question that would be applicable to most of the people in the room, if not all of them, rather than a question that's just about your particular Well, the government website is actually not bad. Um, um, Ontario.ca is actually a relatively good website. Um, you know, if you were to do it in the context of Ontario Parks, well, we OntarioParks.ca is an excellent website. Um, I, I think you would start there. Um, I think you'll probably get your best information from people that are in positions that you're interested in. And so, you know, if I was to use Andrew as an example, you can find Andrew in InfoGo. That's the government's telephone book. It's you just Google InfoGo and you'll find it. You could find the transportation policy. You're a branch. Mm -hmm. uh, you could find the branch. You could find Andrew, and then you could find people that work for Andrew. And and you know, they'll. I would start there. I don't think there's any substitute at all for personal conversation. So as much information as you may be able to find from a policy perspective on particular topics. You know, again, and transportation is a great, a great source of policy topics in current news, uh, transit especially. I don't think there's any substitute for, for actually getting on the phone and calling someone. That's not the easiest thing to do. It takes a fair bit of bravery to do that, and people feel awkward about calling up and saying, you know, hi, I'm Brad. I'm finishing my graduate degree at York, and uh, can I have 15 minutes of your time? <laughs> right? I mean, it's uncomfortable, but tough it out. Um, the reality is, 90% of the people you call are going to give you that time. And so, and the, the other 10%, you probably didn't want to work with them anyway. So my advice would be make the call. You know, my first job in government came courtesy of a, a, the father of a guy I played basketball with in university. And I hadn't talked to the father in 10 years. And yet that person was in a book somewhere that I called him up and I knew he, that he worked for transportation and said, hey, do, do you mind if I talk to your pops for 10 minutes? And he took me out for lunch for two hours. It's a guy I haven't talked to in 10 years. And that started my career, basically. So um, I, I, I think there's a great deal of value in, in making that effort and it'll make you uncomfortable and you're just gonna have to just tough it out. I think your resilience in the process is the most important quality. And so, um, you know, part of your research can be internet-based, all the information is there. I think the most important part of your research is developing a list of contacts so you can, you can apply faces to and learning from those people. Uh, well, one thing that I would um, mention this is a good opportunity. I, I used to work with Bradley at uh, the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, and we do a lot of uh, press conferences. So, especially if you're interested in communications, but also if you're you know looking at policy or whatnot, 
go to uh, to one of those events. You know, we we've had them at York University. You know, just uh, you know, check around. You'll you'll see a sign, and we're about to and just go to it. Uh, see what kind of questions are being asked, and chat up some of the the people that are working there. And also uh, watch the uh, legislature channel as well. That's a good way to see. Honestly, it, it can be really boring, but sometimes it can be really <laughs> funny too. The, the, the just interesting things sometimes, but it gives you a really good opportunity to see uh, what people are talking about, what the issues are, and to also see how the government um, responds to, to different questions. All those things that uh, ministers are saying when they stand up were written by people like me and, and these other people here. So. You know, that's the kind of work that, that you'll be doing in government. To, just to follow up on what Bradley said, absolutely reach out to people who work in the government now for some of their time. Use, do it by email. You know, you can find us all in the InfoGo website. The beautiful thing about e email is that it is, um, uh, I want to say, asynchronous, if that's the word I want. The point is, if you send me an email and I can answer it, I'll answer it. If I can't answer it right now, but I can answer it in four hours, I'll answer it in four hours. If you call me, you are demanding my attention right now. And I may not be able to give it to you right now. And if I realize that this is a cold call informational interview and you're taking my time when I'm already being dragged apart in three other files, I'm not going to be thinking of you very fondly. Uh, email, <laughs> email, I, I, you want honesty, I'm being honest. So I disagree uh, with that, but anyway. Honorable men may differ. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I regard email contact much more favorably because then I can respond to it uh, at the, an appropriate time with the appropriate amount of care. On the phone, I may not be able or willing to do that. So email is the way to go. Well, um, just the, from the civilian aspect of things, um, again, the process is a little bit different for that as well. But when it comes to civilian opportunities, um, most of our jobs, actually all of our civilian opportunities are posted on the government website and that you can find on the www.gov.on.ca. So any jobs that the OPP has will go on that um, government website because we are provincial. You will find with the municipal services, if you're looking for a job with their service, you can go directly to their website. But for OPP, you cannot do that it has to be on the government website. And if you've been on there, you know that any jobs that's open, that means that anybody from the general public can apply for that. If it's restricted, that means that only an uh, Ontario Public Service employee could apply for that um, job. So, you know, there are civilian opportunities, but it's something that you just have to keep an eye on on the website on a daily basis. And again, like they mentioned, if it's a job it will tell you what the specs are. You're going to do your resume, tailor it to that um, job uh, advertisement. A lot of people ask me, well, can I just leave a resume? It doesn't work like that within the government. You have to find that job and um, apply specifically for that job and get yourself ready for that job. Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw you end up Um, I suppose so. I've never. I, I, I suppose it's a good idea. I've never actually uh, uh, looked at someone's LinkedIn profile, but uh, I know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I'm not. I'm the bad person to ask this question. To. I, I think that's a terrific idea. I think LinkedIn is a fantastic way to market yourself. Um, I think, um, unlike other social media activities, LinkedIn is relatively harmless. Um, people <laughs> feel generally very comfortable with LinkedIn. They don't feel threatened by adding you. Um, and I think LinkedIn has a number of marvelous tools, groups and discussions and all sorts of different things where if you've targeted a particular person or area you want to network with, that, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I would differ on email because um, uh, with a large organization, I get close to 300 emails on a daily basis. And so those get actually sorted by an executive assistant and into piles that I should read and piles that I won't. And so my concern would be that I might never get to you. Um, so that's where I would I would differ in that regard. Is my email is actually a function of someone looking at my email. Um, it's just the only way to make it manageable. 
Yeah, and it would be the same for us too. We have a, a general public mailbox that people um, you know, send an email to and someone <laughs> reads it and if, it, if it's something that they think that we should know, you know they'll, they'll send that email out to us. Yeah, LinkedIn's a terrific tool, it really is. Perhaps the way to, to finesse this difference is to start by sending an email and then you know, two weeks later, maybe less, follow up with a phone call. Uh, I'll be much more inclined to regard your call favorably if I know that it's because it was an email that I got and then didn't read. Because then I feel the onus is on me to make the situation right. So you want to make him feel guilty. You start with the email and then you move on to the voice. <laughs> It depends on the field. Uh, if you're in, I couldn't begin to tell you what an entry level IT person would need in the way of technical skills. In the policy world, what I look for uh, is certainly familiarity just with the office suite. You better know how to use Word. Uh, I, you better know how to use Excel, even if you're not an economist. Uh, it seems like everyone in the government writes in PowerPoint, which is terrible, but, but there it is. So you should need know how to use PowerPoint as well. And I've known some positions where access would be helpful. But essentially, you need the Microsoft Office suite of tools. That's all that we need in the way of technical stuff. Well, you should know how to use email. Doesn't everyone know how to use email <laughs> these days? Yeah. I know for us, it's a little bit different. In communications, there really are no entry level positions. Even if you're in the most junior position, you're going to be doing the same type of work. We need people who can kind of get the job running. Um, I know one of my first jobs uh, in the government was at the Ministry of Labor. My first day on the job, I was sent to the Premier's office to work on back-to-work legislation. I'd never done that before. I'd never worked on legislation, so <laughs> <laughs> I just showed up and had to write uh, news releases and Q's and A's and all the stuff to prepare for this. Uh, so we need people who can really kind of think on their feet. So like I said, if, if you're getting an interview, we know that you have the skills. You, we know that you can write. You know, those are kind of basic things. Uh, but we're really looking for that, that type of personality, that person who's not going to be like, oh my god, I can't do this, you know, give it to someone else. We're looking for people who can jump right in and, and just do it. And, and we're ready to help. We don't expect people to know everything. Uh, you know, the government has its own way of doing things, which is different, just like any other company, really. And uh, so we're not looking for that. We're looking for that type of personality. Oh, well, well, I can just add that, you know, in, in addition to your question that each job, you know, has its own special skills that one would need. So, um, you know, you just have to look for the job that you are interested in and just make sure that you have all those skills. So it's really hard to say what that entry level skill is for any job until you see what the job is. I would only add that there are a couple of essential skills that I always look for. One is financial literacy. Um, the government is all about spending tax dollars. At some point in your career in government, you're going to be in charge of that, either accounting for it or explaining how it's spent. So if you can't read a balance sheet, um, I would suggest for everybody before you finish what you're doing here, take a, take a very simple basic accounting course and become financially literate. Hey, it's great for you as a person, right, um, now that you've accumulated all this student debt, um, but, but nonetheless, um, but nonetheless, financial literacy is an incredibly important skill. It, it crosses all the boundaries from operations to policy to everywhere. At some point, you're going to be dealing with dollars and cents. Um, the other thing I would say is y you really should have a, a great sense of political acuity, and that's something that most people develop over a period of time. And that's really kind of a spidey sense that says, holy, like this is going to be a problem, and I need to make sure people know about it. Um, and political acuity is remarkable because not only does, you know, your, our primary jobs in each of our different ministries, and yours as well, is to make sure we don't embarrass the minister. It's, it's a little bit counterintuitive to many of the other things we do, and it's difficult to accept sometimes. But the reality is there's, there's someone elected at the top of ministry, and your job is to make sure they are always very prepared and not surprised or embarrassed. So if I was at the Pan Am Games right now, I imagine I would be pretty nervous about how well I've been preparing my minister. 
Um, you know, and, and all of us, I think, have been in that position at a certain point in time where we're on the receiving end of that. Um, you know, I lost a billion dollars once and, uh, and took about a week to find it in, in, a, in a particular government program. And, you know, that sounds appalling, but the reality... He was in the couch cushions. He was in the couch cushions, yeah. <laughs> but the reality was that uh, the funding earmark for one university just happened to go to another. And so things like that happen. You have situations, but y your political acuity has to be turned on high all the time. You constantly have to be thinking, will this be something that my issues person is going to have to work on? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you build good relationships in the ministry when, when you're very transparent and you're very able to make sure people understand, uh oh, this is not good. Um, and people need to know about that. I, I would underscore what Bradley just said about financial literacy. Uh, and my first job with the government was with the Ministry of Infrastructure. And I said I got it because I, I had a PhD. But I also think, and I am not kidding, because there was a substantial financial component to that job. One of the things that came up in my follow-up interview was that, of, of all things, I had been the treasurer of my college's debating union as an undergraduate. I'd kept the books all year. And he said, oh, so you know how to read a balance sheet. You know how, you know, and I said, well, yes, absolutely, I do. And I think that helped. I don't know to what extent, but I think it helped. So if, yeah, I, I've since gone on to take accounting courses uh, and they've been very helpful to me. But if you don't have time for that, there are ways to get that experience outside of formal education. I'm sure there are student clubs or churches or not-for-profit organizations or charities that need help. You, there's, you know, these, they're always begging for people to have volunteer experience. So go and get some volunteer experience helping run the books for an organization like this. And you know, that goes beyond just the financial stuff. If there's one piece of advice I'd want to give you, it's that what you want to have on your resume to get the interview. I mean, we've all been saying, you know, we're going to give you an interview because we know that you're qualified. How do you get that interview? By having a good resume. What should the resume say to get to that interview? I would say, and well, my colleagues may differ, but I would say what it needs to show is less credentials and more skills. You want to show that there's something you know how to do, whether that is, you know, obviously there's very little call for writing briefing notes outside of government, but showing that you're capable of writing short pieces, you know, showing that you're capable of doing basic research, showing that you're capable of doing media work. It doesn't matter whether you get that from your classes or whether you get that through other venues, like working in a club or a not-for-profit. If you can show that you have some skill, some experience doing some sort of work, that's what your resume should show. That's what we look for. That's what I look for when I'm looking at a resume, is I'm looking less for really good grades than evidence that this person has done something I need to have done before. Because that means that it's likely that if I hire them, they'll be able to do it again. So now is the time, I would say. I mean, it's only, what, October 1st today? Uh, I don't know how many of you are here for another year, but you've got a lot of time to go out and do, maybe not take courses, but certainly volunteer to plug any holes in your resume that need to be plugged. Go and look on our job site right now. See what an issues management officer or a policy advisor, what skills that they need check off the ones you've already got, the ones that you don't have, go fill it. Whether it's by course or some other means, just go fill it now. Then you'll be prepared when the time comes that you have to start submitting, uh, applying for jobs. And another important thing that I'm looking for is that, and uh, Bradley mentioned that the political acuity, um, and financial is another important one because basically everything we do in government deals with finance. But um, also understanding what's gonna be important to, to people uh, what people are going to pick up on, whether it's just an average individual, the media, the opposition. That's why I say it's good to watch Western period because it, it, it's sometimes surprising what people will pick up on. Uh, you know, the, with the you mentioned the um, the Pan Am Games, people don't pick up on you know 700 million dollars being spent on uh, a new stadium or something that isn't really needed, but they will pick up on a dollar eighty nine cup of coffee, you know that kind of thing. 
So really pay attention to what's going on and what's important to people, because no matter what type of job you do in government, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with the public, and it's important to know what's important to people and really understand that and be able to, to communicate that. I would put as many languages as you can possibly speak on your resume, and you know, and I'll make a, I'll make a, uh, I'll make an admission. I've actually stopped checking resumes for spelling mistakes. A little while ago, I did a little bit of an audit of resumes that I had excluded, and it turns out that I had excluded almost 80% of people that weren't born here. And so I checked myself for a fairness issue, right? I'm penalizing people for their second language. Now, my first language is actually French, um, although it's at this point in my life, it's likely my second language now. Um, and so I would say uh, Ontario has changed dramatically in my short lifetime. And so in the next 25 to 30 years, the requirement for the public service to deal languages other than English and French is going to be very significant. Um, uh, there are a number of wonderful communities in southern Ontario where I'm the clear minority. And so I would say whatever languages you can bring to the table, they are absolutely valuable. And I would absolutely include them. Yeah, we deal uh, routinely with the uh, media calls from other countries. Yeah. Uh, I dealt with the um, media call recently from Vietnam. Uh, we did um, a long interview with our minister with uh, a Filipino uh, television uh, network. Uh, so it's good to have uh, people that, that we know of, either within our branch or within the ministry, that have those language skills and understand the, the different cultures and, and the different countries. Too. Uh, absolutely. And more yeah. important, every single day, population growth in Ontario is immigration. That's what yeah. it is. So I would say absolutely include that. Yeah, it'll make you more competitive than the next person beside you that doesn't have that second, third, or fourth language. Yeah. Yeah, so don't leave it off. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to imagine a situation where it can be considered a liability to include that. And yeah, I can I'm, only think me either, yeah. I can yeah. only think that it's being used as a proxy for racism. Yeah. That oh, if this person speaks language X, then clearly she belongs to ethnic community Y. And we all know what they're like. So but I I can honestly say that I've never seen any evidence of that sort of bias in the public service. And I can also honestly say that if anyone displayed that sort of bias in the public service, yeah, would they be. would be turfed so fast. There was a story in the media a few years ago where someone uh, applied for a job and the person replied back with uh, what we, an ethnic slur that I won't repeat and it hit reply instead of forward so it went back to this person and it became a front page uh, story in the newspaper. So my colleagues and I were curious. We knew the name of this person that had made that mistake. We monitored that person's name in the internal system within four days, gone. There's absolutely, like, not even a shadow of a tolerance for any sort of uh, racist or prejudiced hiring practices. So if you're at all concerned that you might trigger something like that by including a language marker on your resume, I would say you don't need to be worried about that and that there's far more advantage, there's, there's huge advantages. I really don't think there's a disadvantage. So no, no fear. I've worked for 12 assistant deputy ministers in 13 years. 10 of the 12 have been women, for example. If you want to think about remarkable gender balance in government, of all the deputies that I've worked for, at least 70% of those have been women, and uh, women of a distinct minority. And so I think you'll find that the Ontario Public Service is really deeply committed to being a diversity employer, a gender equity employer. Um, that's not to say that oppression doesn't exist. Um, that would be, it would be an absurd statement for me. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think you can count yourself equitably treated every time you apply to the Ontario Public Service.
student employment runs, ads for student employment start, I believe, in February, and they'll run until approximately May. The Ontario Internship Program, I believe, starts availability also within that window, although it's, it's much earlier. less smaller. It's mid-January. Is it mid-January? Yeah, yeah, it runs so, shorter. Yeah, um, you, can, you can start applying in December. It can, yeah, that early, eh? And so um, it's pretty overt if you go to gojobs.ca. That's, you know, like... Yeah, all the information about all the different it's programs. It's awfully right clear, I think, on the website. Yeah. But it's, it's, you, you make a good point, because the internship program, which we've earlier been hyping as one of the best entry points into government, has a very narrow window which starts you know, right around the new year. If you're even considering it, you wouldn't want to be in the position where it comes March, you want to apply, and that window's closed. You're gonna to have to wait until the following January to apply. Where you may not be a student anymore, right? Yeah, so I think there's a little wiggle room there, but you don't want to be in a position where you have to wait eight months before you can even apply. So if you're even considering government, you might want to set a reminder now to look at the website around January 8th or so, just to, and then think hard whether we want to apply. And if you do, take advantage because that window closes so fast. Yeah, that's fair. I think the purpose of the call is to find out what's really happening there and to learn about it. I think it's less an opportunity to market yourself initially. Uh, my advice would be there isn't a good time of day. Um, you know, my workday starts at around a quarter to six and it ends at around 20 to 10 at night. Um, I'm not at work that whole time. I'm on my Blackberry, I'm in my car, I'm all over the place. Um, and so my suggestion would be, I don't know that it's particularly a good time. The likelihood for a lot of cases is that you'll get through to Depending on the level of person that you're calling in the hierarchy, you may get through to an admin, admin assistant, which is great, by the way, because those people will answer the phone and they will put you into the schedule. Um, if you're calling people that don't have an admin assistant or are at a level where um, there are staff that are working directly on files, um, and I don't think this is a good time of day at all. You know, um, Andrew's point is a good one. It be, would be his preference to get email, um, and so I would be sensitive to that. Your opportunities to market yourself are in the conversation. I think the call's purpose is to get the conversation started um, so that you can learn about that particular area you're interested in. And Some if I time. don't have time to, I'll tell people when a good time to call me is. Yeah, so. yeah, it's a great, yeah. You can't, yeah, you absolutely can't generalize when it's going to be different from office to office when the yeah. busy time is. Don't day call day. Friday at 3. Yeah. That's uh, good advice. I was going to say, if you... I mean, I'm this so is, not going to answer the phone Friday at 3. <laughs> in, in my experience, uh, the busy times are... Mondays and Fridays are always busy yeah, because people true. are either processing all the work that happened over the weekend yeah. or they're getting work in the hopper to be done over the weekend and they always want to get it done. So yeah, don't call, if you have to pick a day, maybe not Monday or Friday. I guess you do have to pick a day. Yeah. We can talk about that a little bit if you want to, you want to ask after the session is done because I think, I think that's a very particular advice. Work before the government of Ontario, uh, what are the basic academic qualifications? Uh, would, you, would you recommend a graduate degree or a uh, four years undergraduate degree would be enough? I, I think, um, yeah, I think it really depends on the position, right? You'll see positions yeah. that will require a significant academic depth of knowledge. Entry, entry level. Yeah, entry level. Hey, I have a four year music degree in opera, for God's sakes. I mean, you know, clearly we'll hire anybody. So, um, and so, you know, I have one of the least useful degrees probably in government. And yet, you have to remember getting a degree is demonstrating that you can achieve goals maturely, right? It's about your growth as a person as well. It's about learning how to be an adult. It's about learning how to deal with people in a, in a mature environment. There's so much value out of that degree that's not necessarily the academic value. 
it's very much dependent. I, I would recommend that, you know, if you have an undergrad, um, you know, make sure you're getting a graduate degree for the right reasons because it's expensive. Yeah. You know, I didn't get an MBA because at a certain point in my career, people with MBAs were working for me. So it didn't make sense. Now, that sounds arrogant, but the reality is it didn't make sense for me to spend money on an MBA because by the time I thought about getting one, it, it, for my career path, it happened to be redundant. But for yours, it's very individual. And so I would say there's no magic level that I could give you. Um, what, uh, what is the majority of uh, employees at uh, the ministers uh, in Ontario? Yeah, uh, what degrees do they have? Yeah. I, can only, I can only speak for my narrow slice of experience, which is the policy <laughs> and finance world. And there we, we saw all sorts. I'm not the only PhD working for the government, and there's lots of bachelor's degrees. We did tend to see a, a more master's degrees, and they tended to be either in economics or public policy. But Bradley's got a degree in music. I know someone who did his PhD on uh, Immanuel Kant. So really, uh, I wouldn't look so much at a degree when I was hiring as I would look for, you know, uh, I would just, what, what Bradley just said, what is a degree? A degree is a signal. It's a signal to your employer that you're capable of doing a certain kind of work in a certain kind of way. But it's not the only signal. Equally good signals, maybe better, depending on the, the, the situation, would be evidence that you care about, that you've worked on the, the file that the, the policy office is working on. I'd put a lot more stake on someone with a BA who had done some part-time work at Metrolinx than I would for someone that had an MA in housing, social housing, that wanted to come work on transit. Because I can easily see how the former person could fit into the office and make a contribution. I can sort of see it for the second person, but it's less obvious. That, that master's degree is less of a signal than the other person having done a four month stint at a transit agency. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm far more interested in someone who's useful than someone who's educated. Yeah. And, and it, it's hard to bridge, you know, and I, I, I don't denigrate your accomplishments because uh, you know, I stopped long before you did. Um, but I, I see a fair bit of, 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 I see numbers of candidates now in natural resources with master's level science degrees where I'm looking to find the usefulness of the candidate in a field work exercise. Generally, I can make that tie. But if I'm looking for them to be a park warden and wear a vest and do enforcement, and if I'm looking for them to do, you know, to fill an ecology role um, in a particular area, um, I struggle with that because unless that person is absolutely dedicated that master's to flying squirrel ecology, which believe it or not we study, um, then I, I can't find the usefulness in the candidate. And so it's really about what's important to you um, that's going to bring that out, right? You're going to study something that, that is hopefully meaningful and hopefully that is what, we're, that's where I'm going to find you as a candidate, a desirable candidate. There are some differences, like I know in communications, most people come from a background of you know, journalism, journalism yeah. or communications. Yeah. But then for some other jobs in our ministry, like we have the Geological Survey of Ontario, and we actually had one position that we filled um, last year that we had to go to England because nobody in Canada had the right credentials. Yeah. So in that case, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when it comes to uh, policing, like I mentioned before, you could have pretty much anything, BA, Masters, just a, a you know a diploma anything because your skills that you would have you know gained through taking those courses that gave you that BA or masters you can transfer those skills within the job that you that, that you have you know leadership skills maturity life experience all of those things that you're going to be able to demonstrate outside of you know your degree so those are what we're looking for that sounds like the education is an important piece of the
You have to think about, it depends on what sort of career you're going to be, what, what government job you're looking for, what sort of skills they want. But let me just pick a few that I think are broadly, you know, universally appropriate. Uh, group work, showing that you were involved in a project, irrespective of what kind of project it was. The fact that you were able to work with a group to achieve the project's goals is a good thing to be able to show. Um, showing that you were able to do that project in a timely fashion. There's nothing more important in government than, um, the only thing more important in government than, there's only one, you want to get it on time. The only thing more important than getting it done on time is to get it right. Ideally, you want both of those things. So to be able to show that you were involved in a project that had a deadline and you were able to get it done for that deadline successfully is good. Even if it's a project of one person, you had to do something and you did it, and you got it done on time is good. Uh, as for skills, then it really depends on the ministry. As a policy analyst, I would be, if you were working in a club and you had to write something we did way back in the dawn of time when I was with that debating union is we had to make proposals to student government to fund us for a particular tournament that we wanted to go to or event that we wanted to put on. So we had to write a funding proposal and bring it to the student government. That is, then I went on for six years, that's what I did for the Ministry of Finance, was look at funding proposals that ministries were bringing to the government. That was a way that you can say, is like, I know how to write a funding proposal. And I'll say, well, you don't know how to do it for the government, but you do know how to write a funding proposal. I can tell you what you need to know to do it for the government. So, again, I, there's really no ex ex there's really no substitute for finding the job description of the job that you want, looking at the sorts of things that that job does, and then seeing how the things that you do or could do could be analogous to those things. Well, you know, I would say similar to what we, um, we've we basically talked about, even for students without disabilities, you still have to do your research. You still have to demonstrate that passion for, for the job. Um, also, making those calls. So those are things that, um, you know, a student with disability can do. I mean, it all depends on what, it, what their disability is, too, um, that will allow them to do certain things that maybe others may not. But just you know, researching the job that you're really, really interested in, tailoring your resume in your cover letter, cover letter um, for that job. Yeah, I, I think uh, the Ontario Public Service is a top equity employer. Mm -hmm. I, I think <coughs> I don't, I can't particularly think of, of positions where the, there are disabilities. I can particularly think of positions where there are particular disabilities that are a barrier to employment. You know, if I think about forest firefighting, well, you need to be pretty able-bodied to be able to do that as an example. And so those barriers are going to exist, but I think for any person disabled or not, those are relatively obvious barriers. Um, I think when, uh, I think short of that, um, my advice would be um, a person with a disability is no different than any other person that is applying to government, and they'll be treated as such. Um, disabilities certainly can be declared as part of the interview process in order to be accommodated. Right? And so there's a, a pile of legislation that ensures that. And I've been involved in that and found that process to be relatively good for both the interviewer and the interviewee. Um, and so I, I don't have any advice in that regard other than to make sure that if you have a particular set of needs, make sure that they get accommodated so that you have the best experience that you can. Um, and certainly, again, in my experience, uh, and I've probably conducted a couple of hundred interviews now in my career, um, uh, in every case where it was reasonable, th those, those accommodations were made um, once they were declared. If they weren't declared, then we did the best we could when we got there. Um, but I certainly have a number of colleagues with what I would say are relatively obvious physical disabilities that are, um, that are exemplary. And, and they have, to this point in my experience, they've been like anybody else. Um, and I'm happy to say that. All right. Um, so this brings us to the end of our formal Q&A session now. Um, so our intention for this afternoon's session was to 
provide students with the opportunity to learn about different tips and strategies to securing employment with the OPS. Um, so we trust that you found this information uh, and advice from our panelists helpful. There have been a lot of really great nuggets today, I think. And if you are looking for any support um, with things like um, coming up with those, those examples or sharing in an interview, we have interview practice sessions that we do one-on-one -on -one here. So applying to the Ontario uh, internship program and checking that out keeping you on the calendar for January. We shouldn't um, just be trying to get a job um, for the sake of getting a job to survive, but we should actually um, know what we want and uh, have a narrow, um, narrow down our goals, right, to um, to put resources built that we are actually willing to Maybe your first job isn't in Toronto, <gasps> right? Maybe your first job is somewhere else. There is a government office in every single town greater than 10,000 people in Ontario. So maybe your first job is in Timmins, where it's winter eight months a year. Maybe it's in Thunder Bay, maybe it's in Wawa, maybe it's in Ottawa, Brockville, Cornwall, Aurelia. You really are, you know, when you compete for a job in Toronto, you're competing with six million other yeah. people, and that right. sucks. You have the whole problem. Right? Yeah. But when you compete with a job in North Bay, you're actually maybe competing with a thousand that may be eligible, right? And the good thing about the OPS, you know, too, is once you've got a job in the OPS, you can, you can apply to other opportunities. Yeah. You can move around. There's a lot of really good Tons opportunities of jobs. for that. You know, and a good friend of mine didn't want to apply for a job because he didn't want to be the only Vietnamese guy in Thunder Bay. And so I said, have you ever been to Thunder Bay? And he said, no. I said, well, why don't you do some research? Sure enough, there's a community that he was interested in that was there. And now he's having a great experience. He's been there for five years. So don't limit yourself with the GTA. Because frankly, this is the most competitive job market in the country, right yeah. here. And that, your first opportunity might be somewhere else. That said, I, the most competitive, jo hard to get jobs in the policy world are all with the agriculture, food, agriculture, rural Guelph. affairs <laughs> in yeah. Guelph. Because that's, right. that's where all the people want to move to for yeah. the second phase of their careers, yeah. is get out to Guelph where the, 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 it's beautiful and the cost of yeah. living is low. You know, and I moved from Queen's Park to Peterborough in the last two years when I took on this position that I'm in now. And let me tell you, it's a hell of a lot cheaper to live in Peterborough than it is to live in, in where I used to live at Jane and Bloor. So give some consideration. Um, start your career somewhere else in the province and have a different experience. You can always come back to Toronto and pay more.